This week's video is focused entirely on making spouts. I'll take you through how I do them, together with going over some tips and tricks I've learnt along the way, as well as demonstrating a number of other techniques and troubleshooting some issues you might run into, including this rather unbelievable one of using butter of all things. I'm going to preface this tutorial with the simple fact that pulling spouts is arguably one of the aspects of this craft that I'm weakest at. So after you've watched this video, seek out films made by others, as just like any technique when it comes to creating pottery, there are endless techniques and ways of doing the same thing. And whilst I might be able to say I'm an expert at throwing and trimming, pulling spouts is perhaps the activity I've practiced least. But I'll try my best to explain the hows and whys and the method I use to create spouts that pour nicely. This process starts, of course, with a pot of some type being thrown on the wheel. For me, the spout is always the final step, the last feature that's added before the pot is sliced off and removed from the wheel. The rims of the pots you make are vitally important to the spouts that are going to be pulled into them. But before I do that, if it is a spouted vessel I'm going to be making, I make sure the internal wall below the spout is nice and smooth relatively. It doesn't have to be completely flat, but if there are prominent throwing rings, they can have an influence on how the liquid flows into the spout and out of the jug. So I just soften them somewhat. Now, I'm going to begin by showing you two types of rim that perhaps aren't suitable for this first spout pulling technique. And all the tools you're going to need to make spouts are two digits that are kept dry and another one which is dipped in water which is going to stretch the clay out between a dry finger and thumb which are held sturdy on the wall of the pot to brace it as the wet finger stretches the lip out. Now in this instance I've left a rim that is too thick for stretching and pulling the spout like so. Due to its initial thickness even after the clay has been pulled out the pouring lip itself is still going to end up being relatively thick and therefore quite rounded and ideally to achieve a pour that's neat and doesn't drip too much we want an edge that's sharp. This way when the pour is initiated and then disengaged the fine lip of clay will cut the stream of liquid and that can be demonstrated easily enough with two shapes that aren't meant to be used as pouring vessels. This mug has a relatively sharp lip and when the liquid is poured out of it it flows out in a nice clean stream whereas the rim of this bowl is rounded and when used to pour the water flows around the rim and dribbles down the exterior shape of the bowl. So the shape of the rim you make prior to pulling the spout is very important. Although this isn't to say that you should make the lip as thin and fine as possible prior to pulling the spout, as other issues can arise if you make it too delicate. Here's a razor sharp rim and whilst you may be able to pull a spout out of it and one that would definitely pour very well, you run the risk of creating an edge that is too delicate in terms of functionality and it could easily tear too as the material is stretched and you can just about see it beginning to do that here and that could eventually lead to something like this. Now this doesn't mean that you can't create spouts in pots thrown with rims that are thick, you definitely can, it just requires a slightly different technique and I'll show you two ways of doing that later in this video. First though I'm going to throw the rim of this cylinder to the thickness I use for my jugs. I thin the walls out towards the top and taper the edge so that it comes to a beveled point on the outside portion of the wall with a cross section that looks something like this. I then very gently place a dry finger and thumb on the wall with a gap in between them. This gap designates how wide your spout is going to be. I then dip my finger in water and slowly begin to stretch that portion of the rim out between them. And even if you leave fingerprints, it's best to leave them at this stage whilst the clay is still very soft, as interfering with the lip too much now could lead to it being misshapen and ruined, so it's best to let the clay firm up before making any adjustments. If you are just learning how to do this, simply spend an afternoon throwing cylinders and pulling spouts all the way around the top. They won't be perfect straight away, mine still often aren't. So let's go over this a bit more closely. Before pulling the spout, I make sure the exterior form is scraped free of any slip. This way my dry finger and thumb don't stick to the surface as they brace it. These two digits stop the circular top from being distorted as the lip is pulled. The wet finger moves back and forth and notice how I'm not using the tip of my finger at all as dragging the tip and the nail over the sharp lip can easily cause damage to the spout. I gradually go back and forth stretching the clay and flicking it out and again I'm careful not to drag my fingertip over the sharp edge and with the spout formed I carefully remove my fingers upward not by pulling them towards me as doing so can yank the spout out of shape. I'm letting the profile of my finger dictate the shape 
that's pulled, and the digit that's doing the work must always be kept wet, otherwise it can easily stick to the rim and tear the delicate lip. And you can just keep pulling and pulling and pulling, all the way around the top, refining your technique and figuring out what leaves the best result. And I'm going to reiterate how important it is to not let your nail curl over the lip, as it can be so easy to damage the integrity of it. It's best to use the length of your finger beneath it. And if you want to pull smaller spouts, simply use a smaller finger. To continue practicing, you can slice away the top, fix the rim, and then get back to pulling spouts until you've run out of clay. And again, before I begin to pull any spouts, I first smooth the wall on the inside and bevel the lip out to a fine point. I support the walls with a dry finger and thumb and then stretch out the clay between them with a soaked finger. Here's how the smoothed wall looks beneath the spout and doing this helps the liquid flow more smoothly into the lip and therefore out of the vessel. So that's how I pull the spouts on my pots, but there are other ways of doing it. The first technique I'll show is how to turn a thick rim into a thinner lip. I begin with a wetted finger and thumb and I gradually move them back and forth on a small portion of the rim. I want to stretch the clay out here and thin it. And depending on the size of the spout you want, I'll squeeze not only the rim of the pot, but a few centimeters below it too. And if done correctly, you should make a lovely smooth arc in the rim of your pot that's slightly higher than the rest of the lip. It's then this area that you stretch and pull out just like before. And by thinning out a section prior to doing this, you should end up with a more pronounced spout. The supporting fingers are released by pulling up, and sometimes I very lightly nudge the corners of the spout back in. But again, it's much easier to do this once the clay has almost turned leather hard. And after very quickly drying this pot out with a paint stripper, let's see how it pours. Not bad. It doesn't gush over the sides, and the liquid pours in a nice steady stream. It even stops relatively well when pulled up, the sharp edge cutting the stream of liquid so it doesn't dribble. But honestly, I don't mind if there's a drip or two. Much of it has to do with how you pour and use the vessel itself. If you're timid and pour very gently, there's a chance the liquid will roll over the lip, even if it is very sharp. So it helps to be confident when pouring. If you're quick in tipping it over and pulling it up, you'll end up with less drips. And sometimes, no matter how carefully you make spouts for jugs or spouts for teapots, the glaze that's applied over them can change how they pour drastically, as they might smother the sharp lip, rounding it, and thus making it pour worse. But this is what's worked for me so far. There is another style of spout, and it's one you often see in British country pottery, such as those made by Michael Cardew at Wenford Bridge Pottery and by Sven Beyer. In 2013, I did a masterclass with Sven where I learned to make these. And instead of being a lip that's pulled, the spout is really bent into place with a rim that's left relatively thick. And despite that, it pours wonderfully. The neck is collared in and then the top is thrown with a very gentle outward curve that concludes almost vertically. The lip is then simply folded almost into this shape with a very pronounced spout and sides that are really pushed in and it's either side where the walls are angled inward that really directs the flow of liquid and prevents it from gushing over the sides. This style of spout requires no stretching or thinning of the rim, which means in some ways it can be easier to create, yet it relies on a very specific thrown shape to work. I adore jugs like this. They're practical, strong, they pour really well, but they don't fit within my world of pots, so they aren't something I ever make in fire for myself. Instead, I continue to make these more subtle pouring spouts, ones that don't distort the overall shape of the pot too much. In every instance so far, the spouts were pulled on shapes that were initially thrown round. And you may find that as your spouts dry to leather hard, the initial more defined shape they had can loosen as the clay dries. So after a day of making, I'll often go back over each spout and delicately redefine its features. It's work that if I try to do immediately after throwing them, I could end up just making the spouts worse. Whereas now that the clay is slightly harder, I can press and smooth certain areas of it without the clay sticking to my hands so much. And here's just a quick demonstration of how these two shapes pour. 
and I hope it's obvious that the shape and style of these spouts dictate how they have to be used. Smaller, delicate spouts should be used more gingerly, whereas the larger folded spout can be poured more vigorously without having to worry about liquid flowing out either side of the lip. In a recent video I made that was about creating pouring bowls, I also learned how important the shape of the pot is to how it pours, especially the portion of wall just beneath the spout. Those that were horizontal or were sloped slightly out poured better on the whole, whereas the pouring bowl I made with walls that sloped inward towards the top poured really terribly. Ultimately, what I'm trying to get across by talking about this is that spouts are tricky. The lips themselves, the shapes of the pots, and the glazes used all have an impact. And for me at least, it's always been a process of trial and error. And still, these days, I do occasionally make spouts which are just useless. And then another time, I'll be utterly surprised by one that works flawlessly. But I hope some of the things discussed in this video are helpful if pulling spouts is something you're just beginning to learn how to do. The last thing to discuss and demonstrate is simply showing you how various pots work after the handles have been attached and the pots have been glazed and fired. Here's one of the useless bowls I spoke about earlier. It simply doesn't work if filled up with too much liquid, although there is something neat you can do to fix it that's a little bit unusual. And that's, well, spreading butter on the outside of the spout. This obviously isn't a permanent fix, but if you have a pot at home, like a pouring bowl or a jug or a teapot that dribbles badly, you should try this because the difference it makes is unbelievable. The smeared butter, even though you can't see it on the pot, creates a surface that's hydrophobic, so the water is repelled from it, and it makes this pouring bowl that dribbled and sputtered as it poured work flawlessly. Nothing drips down the exterior form, save for just one bead of water that seems to cling on for dear life and you really can't see it at all. And this does make me wonder whether there's a more permanent solution like this. You can also make spouts that aren't pulled or folded and are instead a combination of different thrown components. For this one, I threw a small cylinder, cut it in half and then attached it to the larger pot. And then I pierced a hole through the body for the liquid to flow through. And it works really well, together with being aesthetically a bit different. Here's one of those forms that pours wonderfully. I think due to where the handle is, the sloping upper walls, and the sharp lip that really severs the flow when pouring is stopped. The lip section is also perhaps slightly more pronounced, so I'm definitely going to be making more of this shape when I get back to the wheel. Here's a much smaller spout. It's one I pulled and shaped with my little finger. And it does pour well, provided you don't overdo it and try to pour it too quickly initially. And lastly, a more ornate piece. It's one of my vase shapes turned into a jug. And it works surprisingly well with a very comfortable handle. And it's one of those rare pieces that doesn't drip or dribble at all. If only they were all like this. Anyhow. Thank you so much for taking your time to watch. And if you did find this video helpful, let me know. And make sure you watch other potters videos on this subject. It's just like throwing, trimming, or handling pots. There are dozens of ways of doing it. And you might find some techniques easier than others. Good luck pulling spouts. And until next time, I'll see you later.